When I first met him in 77, I photographed him one day up at the polo match uh, where, and he was getting into his car. As he turned around to thank the host, I noticed he had a big bald spot in the back of his head. And I photographed it, I couldn't believe it. And it was a splash picture the next day and it was the headline, oops, Charles, there's a patch in your thatch. And uh, this is when I first met the, the prince. He, uh, three days later at the polo match, his policeman said he's gonna have a word with you later. And he came up and he's on his horse and there's a picture of it actually of me looking up at him and he's on his horse and he's saying, are you the chap who took my bald spot? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, who saw it? I said, well, probably about seven million people. Oh my God, he said, that's the reason why everybody I go, people are photographing the back of my head. <laughs> but slowly I listened to what he was saying, listening to the speeches he was making and uh, seeing the charities he'd, he started, you know, like for instance, the Prince's Trust. And I've been to every rainforest in the world, I think, with him and listened to as he pleaded with the uh, presidents uh, of the countries to not to rip up these precious resources. And slowly I got to think, well, you know, I don't want to take any more pictures of him uh, that make him look stupid. This may sound like alarmism on a hysterical plane, but there is mounting evidence of a gigantic problem that won't go away. He kept on about it and on about it, and he's been going on about it for 25, 30 years. Now, I happen to believe we live in dangerous times. He's been talking about that for ages. One of the greatest challenges we face today is that of sustainability. He said it's not just for us, it's for our children and our grandchildren, and, and he's, of course he's right. Perhaps the mounting environmental crisis the world faces will concentrate our minds and now suddenly the world's in crisis with, with climate change. It is surely the duty of each and every one of us to find out what we can do to make the situation better. And now people are listening and now people are suddenly saying, well, he's not a crank, he's very much a visionary. We can act now to change the outlook. They almost uh, communicate without speaking to each other. They, they laugh a lot together. They, they've got an amazing, both an amazing sense of humour. <laughs> and uh, sometimes you can't stop them laughing. They just get hysterical. And, uh, and of course she realises that she's the support act. She doesn't try and outshine him. She never does. And she is the first one to applaud his speeches. She is so supportive. Uh, and so they're a good team. He's had a great start, but he's got a lot of traps ahead. You know, he's got Harry whining from America with different sort of private conversations that they've had and, and secrets that the royal family want to keep secret. It's going to be one of the things on his mind, obviously. You know, it's his son, I forgot to say, my darling son. Uh, and, um, you know, you never stop loving your, your children. Um, it's going to be easier because Meghan's not there. He's going to be able to talk frankly to his son, and so hopefully we're William. And I'd love more than anything, the best present you could give the king on his coronation is for William and Harry to heal this rift, to heal this ill feeling between them. If that could happen, put their arms around each other again and hug each other again, um, then it would be, I think, the biggest best present the king could possibly have. The thing that that saddens me most is that, that I never seem, he never seems to be happy anymore. He always seems to be whinging on about something. Now I've been covering Harry since he was a child almost, you know, I was there when he went to Eton and started school, all his nursery school and everything. And I've watched him become a, you know, a terrific prince of the realm. And then suddenly met Meghan and that whole thing changed. And now he wrote a book called Spare, which I sadly I admit I bought but I couldn't get past the third chapter because it was so awful, the things he was saying about lovely people like his brother, Queen Camilla, and, and his sister-in-law, Catherine, you know, are really lovely people. He just feels angry about everything and it's so sad because what more can he want? He's got the woman he wanted to marry, he's got two of the most beautiful children, he lives in a beautiful home in the sunshine, he's got all the money he wants, he's making uh, any amount of money he, he needs, he's got, and, um, and, he's, and he's unhappy, and I don't know what will make him happy. I don't think coming to the coronation will make him any happier. I just hope that 
at least they can, him and his brother, have time to chat together, and maybe try and work on some way of healing the rift. If there's any chance of Harry and his father and William having a meaningful conversation, I think her being there wouldn't have helped. I think maybe, I think maybe it'd been the right decision. And also, I feel that there's, there's, there's a tremendous amount of hostility towards Meghan here in this country, and I just would be shame if someone just said something awful because it would totally, totally dominate the, the whole event. You know, if someone screamed at some obscenity at, at Meghan uh, on the day, the whole, the whole mood of the thing would change and I just thought that would be awful so um, please come again Megan you know because uh, you know you're always welcome this afternoon Prince Charles was in Stevenage in Hertfordshire TV cameras and snappers in tow yeah I've always thought the uh, big moments in my life you know I thought when I was asked by the editor mm -hmm. to find out who Prince Charles was going to get married to and then mm -hmm. I did Diana and Charles's wedding at St Paul's I thought that was a, a big moment and then of course um, his second wedding to Camilla, that was a big moment. Prince Andrew's marriage was a big moment, and uh, the death of the Queen Mother was a, you know, there have been a lot of, a lot of uh, highlights. I suppose this one would be, you know, I'm 82 now, I'm not, uh, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm fit, I'm quite fit, and my, but um, I won't be able to go on forever, and I think this is going to be my, probably my last hurrah, big, big occasion. And, um, and I'm looking forward to the coronation so much because it's his final destiny. It's, as I say, it's a job he's been just patiently waiting, never wanting it because that would be the, a, a day of sadness for him. And, and it's finally arrived and I hope he just carries on the same way as he's been since, since the day his mother died. You know, he's my hero in many ways. I like working with him. Uh, and I've enjoyed working with him for, well, since, since 1977, over 40 years, so 40, 45 years. And, um, and I still uh, enjoy photographing him and I'm looking forward to photographing him when he's crowned uh, on Coronation Day. And um, I hope I don't mess it up.